Good morning, everybody. I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Member Engagement Librarian at the South Central Regional Library Council, and that's in Ithaca, New York. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, both the Upstate New York contingent joining us, and we have some people from the Texas State Library joining us as well. Um, you can feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. You just type them into the question box of your command module. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. April Altman Becker is the Dean of Libraries and Research Technologies at Sol Ross State University in Texas, and she's the co-creator of the website The Librarian Design Share. Welcome, April. Thanks, Jessica. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I'm sharing my uh, my webinar or my webcam right now, but I'm going to turn it off in a few minutes because I think it's distracting. But I just wanted you to put a face with a name in case you see me at a conference or somewhere else, feel free to say hi. Um, so I'm April Altman Becker, and I'm the Dean of Libraries and Research Technologies at Silver State University. And I am way out West Texas, out by Big Bend National Park. Um, and let's see, Jessica kind of talked about webinar logistics. So we'll keep an eye on the chat or on the question um, modules over there. You can also raise your hands. And then I will pause periodically for questions, too, and um, take a few minutes to look through and try to answer, answer your questions as you bring them up. Also have time at the very end for questions. So lots of interaction possible. Um, I do want to hear from you guys. Um, I hate to just talk to a screen for an hour. I want to know that you're you know, participating and interested or confused or whatever you are. So um, I guess I'm going to stop sharing this webcam and go ahead and get started. So hang on just one sec. Okay, so you should just now see my screen, which is better. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump in. Um, so you are, you are here today um, to learn more about improving your communication in libraries through better visual design. And much of the work that librarians do involves creating flyers, displays, handouts, websites, and other designs that look good and convey helpful information. But very few of us have any kind of formal design training, including myself. And we often have to rely on our personal aesthetic preferences and the opinions of others when we're making designs. So the goal of this program today is to empower you with the basic principles, tools, and processes to begin to improve designs in your own libraries. So here we go. So we're going to begin today by discussing why good design is important. And after that, we're going to talk about a design workflow. Um, which is going to include the processes that I found helpful when designing visual materials and some basic principles of design to improve the look and the effectiveness of your materials. And then I'm also going to share some free and, and also some low-cost tools and software that I find useful when I'm making designs for libraries. And then finally, to tie everything together, we'll talk about um, how consistency in design leads to better branding and overall communication with your library users. So design is everywhere. Um, whether you realize it or not, as a librarian, you end up designing things every day. So I have a question for you guys to start this off. Um, think about the last three months or so, maybe even the last semester of your work. Uh, what kinds of things have you designed for print or for web during that time? And you can answer that in the question box. And I have a feeling we're probably all designing the same things, and that's why we're here. So let's see. I think I see some people. Oh, OK. Let me expand this little box a little bit. Jean saying Iliad web pages. Interesting. OK. And Not Catherine. a whole lot of Oh, go ahead. And Catherine uh, and Angela both said content for web pages. Doris says program flyers and signs, instructions for summer reading. And Laura says flyers and calendars. And Angela said print brochures for summer reading club. Christine says brochures. Good. OK, so it's kind of a combination, it sounds like. Um, I don't see any bookmarks. Um, kind of a com combination between uh, print design and web design, and I hope that this webinar is going to hit both of those things for you. Um, obviously, the way you design those those two media are um, you know different in process, but the same in design principle. So um, whether it's bookmarks or flyers or web pages, um, you you have creativity available to you, and um, hopefully, I'll be able to to give you some tools today. 
So all of us are pretty much designing our own things. Um, and in a perfect world, we could have a professional design resource person on hand. We could have a designer working in the library. And some libraries are lucky enough to have that, but most of us are not. Um, so, because we're designing our own stuff all the time, it behooves us to learn a little bit more about how to design things well. I'm here because I think good design is important, and before the webinar, Jessica and I were talking about design and what kind of backgrounds we have in it. Um, neither of us have any kind of background in design, however, we're both interested in it, and I, I assume you guys are too. Um, and I guess I, uh, I've always been interested in design, and when I got into libraries, I noticed that a lot of libraries have maybe not great design, um, just because we don't ever take down our signage or, you know, we just put up new signage with extra words tacked at the bottom or something like that. So um, it's important to think about design. People respond to our visual messages, and it's a highly effective method of connecting with users. When you create a bad design, or you make poor design choices, or you don't make any choices about your design, it can cause your library to look unprofessional to your audience. However, making a good design is going to build trust and credibility with your users. And your design has an overall impact on how your users experience your library. And we all know that, you know, first impressions are really important. So when people come in your doors, you want them to notice that your library um, looks consistent, that it looks professional, um, and then it just kind of looks neat. So talking all about good design, we all know that there are barriers to producing good designs in libraries. Um, so let's go ahead and get the negatives out there, because I know in the back of your head you're all saying, but I don't have time, I don't have money, I don't have skills, whatever. Um, so go ahead, if you have reasons that, you know, good design is a barrier or something to you, put it in the question box and let's get it out. So what are some barriers to making designs? I see Doris has already answered that um, she loves good design, but she's not really proficient with the tools like Canvas and Photoshop and that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that. Yeah, there's so much information um, to try to put on, on Discovery. There's no time to learn other types of design besides Publisher. That's okay, you guys. I use Publisher every day. Um, that is my tool. Some other barriers, um, money. Lots of times we think that we need Photoshop or something fancy to make good designs. Um, you don't always need that. You can use the tools that come with your computer. Um, software capabilities, sometimes there's trainings, and, uh, uh, trainings allotted to you through your school, or there's tons of online or YouTube tutorials on how to, how to do things. Um, and then maybe just even your knowledge of design. You didn't go to school for design. You went to school for English and then library science or something like that. Um, one thing I haven't seen anybody say in the question box, oh, lack of creativity, true, I'll give you some ideas for that one too. Um, one thing I haven't heard anybody say is um, institutional design restrictions. Um, and that's something that I am not experiencing at my present job, but at my previous position, um, I was at a large institution that had, you know, very locked down standards. We had to use the same font, the same colors, um, you know, the same red line on certain things. Um, and while sometimes that could be helpful because it could give you a starting point for a design, if you ever wanted to be creative, it was kind of a sticking point. So um, sometimes institutional restrictions or standards are hard to get around. Um, I learned to work within them and try to make them complement my designs. Good. And somebody did just say uh, design restrictions colors. Yeah, what if, you're, you know, what if your institution has an ugly color? You're maroon and gold or something like that, and you want to make designs that are brighter colors. Um, it's possible to work within both of them, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there. I'll talk all about colors in just a little bit. Okay, so all the bad feelings out there, um, we have barriers to good design, but I'm going to try to give you some ideas to work beyond those. Okay, so we've got the bad stuff out. Um, let's talk about a workflow, okay? A workflow can get you past some of these barriers and get you towards positive thinking about design. So the first and the most important step in any design project is to engage in intentional thinking. And intentional thinking is a big thing in libraries. Um, it's important to think about what we're doing. We want our students to think about what they're doing when they're researching. So it's important for us to think about what we're doing if we're making signage or a website or something like that. So when we talk about intentional thinking, um, there are a few different ways or a few different um, aspects to think about, I guess. 
So take a step back and think about your audience first. Who are you designing for? Um, you may be making many designs to bring across one message. Um, you know, you, the way you present things to your, your high school students is different than the way you present things to the president of your institution or something like that. So think about your audience. How do they communicate? What's important to them? Again, the words that you're going to use um, to communicate to students may be different to administration. What's important to students might be, um, you know, the latest resources or open lates or study rooms. What's important to administration might be your numbers or, um, you know, your staff accomplishments or something like that. So think about your audience first. Okay, and then while thinking about your audience, think about the message. So focus on your message. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to get across to your people? Are you trying to have people come to the library for a program? Um, or are you trying to share your teaching statistics with your college? So focus on the story you want to tell. And then, you know, focus on that story you want to tell to that audience. And then finally, once you've focused your audience and your message, consider what media is most appropriate for both. Um, you know, is it a post on social media about extended hours for finals? Um, is it a display about your new books that you've gotten in or a display to celebrate, you know, Gay Pride Month or something like that? Or is it a handout, um, an instructional handout or a website to share your statistics? Um, so think about the medium that you're going to be delivering this to. And this is all important. And in the past, I've even made like a little worksheet. So before I make a design, I do, you know, what's my audience, what's my message, what's my medium? And kind of fill it out as a grid and then move on beyond that to the other things that I'm about to talk about. Oops, sorry, skip one. Um, so when you've thought about your, uh, your audience, your message, your medium, when you've done your intentional thinking, the next step in the workflow is to seek inspiration. And a couple of you guys in the chat over there said that, you know, you have a lack of creativity or no original ideas or something like that. Well, this is where we're going to talk about where to find them. So design is partly about preference. Um, I recommend exploring what designs out there speak to you. So you're not designing in a vacuum. Lots of other people, corporations, libraries, all that kind of stuff are also designing things all the time. So there's lots of great designs out there to inspire you. Um, if there's something that you like about a design, study it. You know, do you like the fonts or the colors or the layout, um, combination of all of those things? Equally important, though, is to know when you don't like a design. So if there's a design that you don't like, it's worth exploring why you don't like it. What makes it fail to you? Um, figure out what makes you react strongly against the design, and then learn to work around it. So if it's a certain, um, it's a certain font, you really, I mean, we'll just throw Comic Sans out there. You really hate Comic Sans, and you hate seeing it on signage. Um, don't use it, right? Like, or you really hate this combination of these colors, or you hate it when people make a design and put one tiny little picture on it. Learn that that's not the way you want to design, and don't do it. So, sites for design inspiration. These are a few. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I'm the co-creator of Library and Design Share, um, so I've got to put that on there, right? So if you've not checked out Library and Design Share before, I just kind of want to tell you about it. Um, it's a website that my colleague Veronica Ariana Douglas and I put together about four years ago. So we're both librarians, we're not designers, um, but we would talk pretty much daily about what we were making. You know, I'm making this handout to give out to my uh, English 101 class, will you take a look at it? We'd send it back and forth and say, oh, you should do this instead of that. So finally we decided um, probably librarians all over the world are doing this, and we ought to have a website where we can all post our stuff. And so that's what Librarian Design Share is. Um, it's an open repository. Librarians, library people submit their designs, um, and they can also submit in-process designs so that um, they can get feedback on them. So all the designs you're going to see, all of the... Um, you know, all the handouts, all of the pictures, basically, on this presentation come straight from Library and Design Share. So uh, it's a great place to go and get inspiration. You can search by, I'm making, a, um, I'm making a flyer, and you'll see other people's flyers. I'm making something about, you know, 
some are ours or something like that, and you'll see other, other people's examples out there. So that's a good example um, of somewhere to find inspiration because it's coming from people like us. Of course, there's Pinterest. Pinterest isn't new, and I'm guessing you guys are all playing with Pinterest by now. Um, Pinterest is fantastic to pin your favorite recipes, your favorite you know, books to read, whatever, but um, there are a lot of librarians out there using it as well, so they're pinning really cool designs for libraries. Um, there are a couple sites called Dribble and Behance, and those are sites where professional designers go and upload their work so that you can take a look at it. So generally, um, you're not able to download this work and manipulate it, but it can give you some ideas. It could give you a color scheme to work off of, or maybe you know a type of image that you're really into. Um, there's another site called Design Inspiration, and this is a site that's focused on maintaining high level, great design, and it's international. So they kind of they're like an aggregator. They collect great designs on their site. And then think outside the box. Um, if you are producing something for your library, you don't only have to look at library sites. Um, you could think about you know, posters for your local music shows, or you could think about public transportation ads, or product packaging, or even like stores and the way, the way they've designed their ads and their in-store uh, experiences. So inspiration is everywhere. Book covers, um, other websites, it's everywhere. So where do you guys, I'd like to ask you, where do you find inspiration for designs outside of what's on this slide? Are there any secrets that I don't know about? And if so, put them in the question box. I'll give you a couple minutes. I'll take a drink of coffee. Um, somebody just said, look at other library websites and sometimes visiting other campuses. It's like you're a library spy or a secret shopper, but yeah, that's a great way. Um, and in fact, like, uh, the, like the American Libraries magazines and stuff that come out or Library Journal has like the great designs of the year. There's always great ideas in those kind of magazines. Is Behance now Slate? Huh, I don't know. Um, Behance could be Slate. Uh, last time I checked, it was still Behance. I'll check it after this, this uh, presentation though. Right, and somebody else says, any place we go, museums, other libraries, all of that. Yeah, there's so many places to think about inspiration for designs. Um, like I said, stores, I think Target is a master of design. Um, they're super minimal, right? And they've got the, obviously, the red Target. But their ads are always white with colors. Um, you walk in the store and you're having the exact same experience. Um, clothes stores do those kind of things, too. Um, products, like, I'm trying to think of some favorite products, packaging or whatever. I'm always a sucker for something that looks like it's been handmade, um, like Mrs. Meyer soaps are really cute. So yeah, I mean, everywhere you look out there, Birchbox, somebody just said Birchbox, that's a great idea. Um, everywhere you look out there, there is design inspiration. Okay, so... Moving on past the inspiration, we've kind of thought about our audience, our message, and our medium. We've gathered some inspiration by looking at different sites. We kind of know what our design might want to look like. So the next step would be choosing a design palette. Um, and what that means basically is to narrow down what you're going to work with and set up your design palette. So anytime you work on a craft or a construction project or even when you cook a meal, um, you gather all your materials or your tools or your ingredients before you start to work. And this is the same idea. Um, you want to gather all of the elements of your design, and it really makes the design process much easier, and it makes it flow more naturally. So um, that could start with selecting the colors that you want to work with. So it's a choice to include color in a design. Lots and lots of successful designs are black and white. Um, or they have a minimal two-color design, and it's just part of the aesthetic that they, that they want to convey. If you choose to work with color, you want to keep in mind that color sets a mood, so be sure to think back to your audience and the message that you're sending, and make sure that it's appropriate with the colors that you choose. Let me give you kind of an idea on this. Um, I think you can see this slide pretty well. This is the psychology of color, 
and it's by Spruce Road, which is a boutique graphic design company. And I'm pretty sure I, I pinned this and took it off of Pinterest. Um, but it kind of tells you how colors make you feel. So, um, you know, green alludes to wealth and growth. Blue is usually tranquility. Red is dynamic. Um, pink is feminine. So if you're going to make a, um, you know, a design for, I don't know, a teen boys reading club, you're probably not going to include the more feminine colors um, unless your book relates to that or something like that. But you want, you want your color to speak to the audience that you're, you're putting forth. And again, a lot of us sometimes have institutional restrictions with colors. So find colors that complement your institution's colors. Um, if you're going to use black, for example, it's, it's a feeling of power. It's a contrast. It's the first thing someone's going to see, probably, um, the highest amount of contrast on, the pa on a white page. So just keep these in mind um, as you're designing things. So talking more about color, this is the color palette that I used to create this design, um, or these slides here. So I stuck with complementary colors. And I stuck with the, the, this color scheme throughout the entire presentation. So I tried to keep my colors really bright and cheerful, knowing that this is a presentation delivered to you on a monitor, or maybe some of you are sitting in a classroom and it's being delivered on a screen. So um, I'm hoping that these colors are energetic um, and that they would look good on a screen and kind of keep you awake. So you want to consider these things when you're making designs that are going to be projected because sometimes your projector projects colors that are very different than what your monitor shows you. Um, also keep in mind when you're printing things, your printer could be pretty off on colors. And even um, when you're posting things online, sometimes the web changes your colors. So how do you keep this stuff in mind? Well, you test it. Um, before you give a presentation, you take it upstairs to your classroom um, and you know turn on the projector and give it a shot. Um, it's happened to me before that I've made presentations that are not very readable. And you can see like the very bottom uh, color code, that yellow is hard to read. So I wouldn't do text in that color. I'd need to stick with, with a darker color. So in keeping with, you know, what's the inspiration? Um, that was my colors. I got the inspiration for this presentation from a website called Sneaky Veg, which is a recipe website basically about sneaking vegetables into your kids' foods. Um, the designer is Vicki Turner, and if you go to Sneaky Veg, it's got all these super cool little vegetable icons, um, which and fruit icons, I guess, which weren't appropriate for the presentation. So we took the colors from that and then um, changed the icons to match more of this presentation. So you'll see a lot of pencils and you know arrows and that kind of stuff rather than vegetables. But this is pretty much just to show you that I got inspiration from something that's not library related at all. Um, and so inspiration's everywhere. And you can, you can take colors, you can take a presentation, you can manipulate that without stealing the person's idea. So if you're looking for sources for color inspiration, these are some pretty cool ones. Um, Colorzilla is a site that you go to and you download a browser extension for your Chrome or your Firefox. And once you do that, a little eyedropper feature um, appears next to your it's next to your search box on your browser. And um, as you're on different websites that you really like the colors, you can use a little eyedropper and grab that color, and it'll give you the RGB or the, um, the hex code for that color. So then you can put it into your designs. Um, DeGrave is a site that uploads, that allows you to upload a photo, and then it pulls a color palette from the photo that you're uploading. And Design Seeds does pretty much the same thing. So um, again, you can upload a, you know, a picture of a field of flowers or something, and it'll pull all those colors out and kind of give you almost like, um, almost like a, one of those color samples that you would buy at the hardware, or that you would pick up at the hardware store if you're painting your house. It's pretty cool. And then, of course, it would give you the codes so that you could insert that into your own designs. Um, color Lovers allows you to choose from millions of palettes or to create your own. And then Adobe Color CC is similar to Color Lovers, too. So just a few different sites to kind of um, give you some ideas of where you can go to start putting colors together. If, you're, you know, if you feel like you're not creative, if you're not very great at putting colors together. And let me look over in the question box because I just saw something. 
Um, do I use color picks to match the colors? So um, I don't presently, but that sounds like another tool. So color picks must be another site that helps you match up colors together. That's great. Every time I do presentations, I learn more stuff from you guys to add to presentations. So thank you. Okay, so we talked about colors. Um, just as important as picking the right color for your design is thinking about typography. And typography means really deciding on a typeface and how it's going to be used in your design. So light color, the typeface that you select conveys a mood and a message. So you want to make sure what you're selecting is appropriate for your audience and for your message. Um, you know, are you looking for a more modern and sleek look, something more romantic or something more traditional? Um, no matter what you select, make sure it's readable to others. So a few general rules when working with type. Serif and humanist typefaces, like those on the upper left, um, are more readable in print design. There's something about the little lines on the end of serif letters that makes it more readable in print design. And if you think about the books you read, it's always, you know, a Times New Roman kind of font. Sans serif, though, is more readable online, and it tends to read as more modern. And again, if you think of websites, um, this presentation, uh, things that you see online generally are sans serif. Um, and it does, next to serif, it certainly looks more modern. But that's a choice you're going to make when you're making your design. Do you want a modern or a more traditional font? Um, other, other fonts on here, there's slab serif, which is kind of a combination of the two. And to me, it reads very modern, but it's also kind of hard to read. And then, of course, there's script. And script should only be used probably for an accent. You'd never write a whole page in script. Um, and it can be very pretty, and there's, there's you know, traditional, and there's very new script fonts out there, too. So you don't want to pair more than probably two typefaces in a design, probably three at the most. Um, any more than that, your design starts to look a little disorganized um, and looks like you've just kind of slapped different fonts out there. You can also use typefaces as a design element, like you would an image, and that's kind of what I've done on this slide. So each of these, um, each of these squares are actually images. Um, so you can, use, you can use fonts as an image, or you can make it the highlight of your design. So you don't have to just rely on the preset fonts on your computer. Um, there's lots of fonts out there that you can download for free. And I know the problem that comes up with this is that sometimes you're not an administrator on your computer. Um, presently, I'm not an administrator on my own computer. Um, every time I want a font, I call my IT department and have them come and help me. So <laughs> that's one thing. Um, if you are able to download fonts, it's as easy as going to one of these sites here. So there's the League of Movable Type, and these are typeface designers who provide open source fonts. Um, a lot of these are free. Some of them are low cost. Defont and Font Squirrel are my two favorites. They're aggregators, and they are almost all free. When you go there, there's an overwhelming number of fonts, um, but sometimes, or at least on Font Squirrel, it'll kind of aggregate it into the different kinds of fonts. So you can search for a font by name or by a type. Uh, there's a site called Fonts in Use, and that features websites with good fonts. So if you're looking for a cool font to use on a website you're creating, Fonts and use is really helpful. Um, and there's TypeWolf. TypeWolf is also very cool because TypeWolf will help you decide what fonts to pair when you're making a design. So which two things look good together um, or have the most impact. And you don't always want to choose things that um, complement each other. You might sometimes want to choose things that contrast one another. And then finally, there's Lost Type Co-op. And these are designers who've made typefaces available um, at a name your own price. So somebody makes a font and um, says, you know, you can use my font, but you name your own price. So you can say, I want it for a dollar, I want it for twenty dollars, whatever. Do remember, whenever you are downloading a font that's not standard on your machine, um, or even if you have a newer version of Word, say on your machine, if you're taking your presentation on the go. Um, and maybe you've saved it on a flash drive, save that font with it because when you plug it into the next computer, you know that that font is not going to be present and it's going to mess up your whole presentation. So be real careful about that kind of stuff. Okay, and then someone just entered, what about Comic Sans? You know, 
I'm not a fan of Comic Sans. Um, some people love it. And maybe there's even a place for it if you're trying to appeal to children or younger audience or if you're making you know, a handout that is almost comic book-like. But to me, um, a lot of people have a really visceral reaction against Comic Sans, so it might be better just to avoid it. But of course, this is this, your opinion. Okay, so moving on past the fonts, um, images and icons are powerful elements of any design. So when I am making anything, um, I like to start with a really great image, and then I work from that image out. So I like to match my colors, match my fonts, match my design style to the image. So you want to keep your audience in mind, of course, and you want to choose an, odd, an image that speaks to uh, them and illustrates the concept that you're trying to get to. Um, so think about the message that your image sends, and you also want to think if this message, or this image, I guess, could replace any of the text on your slides. So we've all been in presentations where all the slides are all text, text, text. Um, and you, you know, you can just read the slides instead of listening to the presenter. So more and more, if you're going to use PowerPoint, or even, even on websites and stuff, um, if there is a way to replace some text with an image, your audience is going to respond better. People just don't stop and read walls of text. So um, think about that while you're creating, I guess. Um, and try not to fall into the trap of putting too much text on a design or on a screen. When you are looking for images, you want to make sure that you pick the right resolution for the project that you're working on. Um, an easy way to do this, Google Images has a really great um, search, I guess. We can search by resolution size. Um, and sometimes it's even just like small, medium, or large images. Um, if you are, if you're picking images, you want to make sure that print resolution should be at least 150 dpi. dpi is dots per inch. So 150 for print, you want 72 for web, and then you would want 300 for a big poster. So if you're taking a poster to ALA or something, you want an image on it, you want to make sure that this resolution doesn't pixelate. Okay, nothing worse than um, a flyer or a poster or a presentation with pixelated images. So keep in mind your, um, your resolution. And then the other thing to keep in mind with images is that you want to make sure that they're under some kind of Creative Commons license and you want to give credit if you use someone's work um, with the person's name or a link to the site that you found the image on. And of course if you're using a PowerPoint, you can do that on the slide, you can do it at the end of your slides. If you're making a poster, you want to keep it on your, your work cited section of your poster. Um, just don't, we're librarians, right? We don't have to really say this, but don't use work without permission. Okay, let me look over at the, the question box. I just saw something. Um, will you let us know what presentation program you're using or have you downloaded all these fonts, colors, and images? Yes, totally. So for this presentation, um, I originally made it in Google Slides which I'll talk about in just a little bit. I love Google Slides. Um, however, when I found out that I needed to share my screen, I downloaded my Google Slides really easily into PowerPoint, and um, everything worked out. So everything worked out because these, um, these fonts and these images that I made, I saved each slide as a picture. So that's, that's one way to get around that whole font issue, that your fonts change in different places. If you're making a PowerPoint, you can save your whole PowerPoint slide as an image. And I'll talk more about all of this in just a minute. Okay, so back to the images. Um, the image you're looking at is something that I created a couple years ago. Um, I worked at MD Anderson Cancer Center. This is MD Anderson, and it was his birthday, so we were throwing a birthday party for him. We were really just looking for an excuse to invite our faculty and our students up to the library to kind of connect with us on an informal way. So we threw a birthday party. So um, I found this image in the archives um, at Anderson, and um, we just really loved this photo of him, and it was a photo that not a lot of people had seen. So we were able to take that photo, throw on a happy birthday banner, and make it look a little modern and silly. So other places to find images, um, Flickr, Creative Commons licensed images, or Flickr Commons are really nice to search through. They tell you about the rights, and if it's a, of course if it's a Creative Commons, um, generally you just have to give credit in some way. Again, your archives, your archives are a wealth of local history, of uh, regional knowledge, 
and have tons and tons and tons of photos. So your archives are a great place to look. If you have not played with the Noun Project website before, you should write that one down and go to it right after our presentation. Um, the Noun Project is my favorite website for finding flat icons. So basically you go to the Noun Project and you type in their search box that you're looking for an icon about libraries or about cats or whatever, and it comes up with tons and tons of um, usually just black and white images. Um, when you click on them, you can download them, and it will either allow you to download completely free or download um, crediting the artist, or occasionally um, it will be a pay for. Usually for educational sites, you can get it for free, though. So the Noun Project is super cool. They have an icon for everything. Um, other sites, uh, Gratisography and Pixabay and Picography are all high-resolution photo sites that um, allow you to use their photos as long as you credit the artist. So all good places to get images that are not just um, you know, stealing them off the web or using cartoon images or using copyright, Im copyright images, which, again, you just have to be careful about. Okay, so we've talked about the design palette with the colors, the typography, and the images. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into five basic design principles that will help you improve your work, and they should kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're designing things. So contrast is the first one, and contrast helps you add visual interest and organization to your design. So contrast simply means difference, right? Um, if information is different, you want to make it visually distinct. And you can do this by um, opposing colors, and you can use like opposing colors on the color wheels, red and green. Um, you can do this by uh, alternating fonts, like the different sizes of the fonts, or the colors of the fonts, or even the font weights, like bold and not bold or something. Um, and you can also use different elements um, of different sizes, so different shapes maybe of different sizes. And you can see that this design that you're looking at, um, which again is from Library and Design Share, uses starkly different colors. And it uses different shapes, but similar shapes, right? And pairs them in a way that kind of draws the viewer in. So you want to know what this, you know, what's the big yellow thing, and then what's the blue and the stripes. Um, so I think this is a really good example of contrast. The second design principle that I would think about is proximity. And proximity is basically telling you that items that are grouped together are viewed as one unit. So you can use proximity to your advantage to achieve a more organized look. And this can be done with text or images. Um, so this is the design I created uh, earlier this year. Similar to the MD Anderson thing, I wanted to get our faculty and our librarians um, more casual together. I wanted to take them off campus. And we went to a brewery, and we had um, we sampled beer, and we sampled foods from the local brewery. So it was a huge success, because everybody wants to go out and drink beer together. Um, but this design um, is an example of proximity because on the right side, you can see the whole um, menu, and it's all grouped together as text, and on the left side is the more library-related, um, you know, kind of silly image or whatever, but it all comes together because of, because of the proximity of the design. So alignment is important in any design. Every element that you include in your design should have a visual connection to one another. So items and elements shouldn't be placed at random on a page or a screen. And um, you've all seen you know, terrible designs that have words in the middle and then just images on every corner or something like that. Um, you want to think more about every element that you're creating as being a part of a grid. So kind of, in, in fact, design um, software like Publisher or Photoshop can set you up with a grid so that you can snap your items to a grid. Good alignment helps you organize and unify your design, and it makes it easier to get your message across to your intended audience. So this is an ebook design, and to me, the alignment is pretty obvious, right? You've got three columns. Um, you've got some things that span those three columns, but it's really well organized. Of course, we could argue there might be too much text on the screen, but that's okay. What we're talking about is the alignment of all the text. Okay, there's also repetition, and repetition is repeating or reusing the same or similar elements throughout your design. So you can repeat colors or shapes or textures, um, you could repeat spatial relationships, you know, things are further apart, um, line thicknesses, font sizes, graphic concepts, all kinds of things you could repeat in a design. 
And it's going to bring a sense of unity, consistency, and cohesiveness. Repetition kind of gives the mind a pattern to follow. So contrast is about showing difference. Alignment is about obtaining unity. Um, repetition is about subtly using the same elements to make sure the design is viewed as being part of the whole. So in this design, what's the main repetition that you're seeing? I'll give you guys a second. I want to take a sip of coffee. What do you see repeated here? Yeah, definitely color. Um, it's these, you know, purples and yellows and blues, um, and each thing signifies something different, right? And it's pretty hard to see the, what we get out of the collective engagement circle at the very bottom. Uh, but their word cloud uh, goes really nicely, and it's even in a circle, right? Um, so the shapes, go ahead, and the icons too. The icons are in circles, and I can tell you that all of those icons, because I know the designer here, all of those icons are from the noun project. Good, so to me this is a pretty obvious way to use repetition. But it's also really friendly on the eye. I mean, you, your eye just kind of moves around the page looking at all those different purple circles. Okay, so check out this one. Um, considering all the design principles that we've known now, uh, take a look at the example of this signage, and this is from the University of Alaska Southeast. So this is a submission, of course, to Library and Design Share, and I think it's extremely successful. These are their hours. What do you guys think makes this a successful design? And these are actually two separate designs that I put together. They would have a spring hour sign and then a summer hour sign. What do you think makes this one successful? Yeah, it's super clear, right? It's a minimal design, um, and it's, you know, it uses a lot of white. You can't really see the page borders. Well, I guess you maybe can on your slides. Um, it's only got the necessary information. Yeah, okay, we didn't, um, didn't add a whole bunch of extra stuff. In fact, I would argue that you might not even need their uh, website at the bottom or their email at the bottom. Um, because you're likely walking up to the library's door or something when you see this, and I don't know how many people are going to take the time to write all that stuff down. So it's super simple, super clean. Um, they do use kind of a fun font. The Egan Library is kind of a nice font. You could argue that it's pretty close to Comic Sans, <laughs> but it's, um, it's kind of eye-catching, and, and the other font they use is very serious and blocky. Let's see, I've seen a couple other things come up. Um, somebody noticed that this is a seasonal color. Yeah, I think that's so cool about this design. This is, this is Alaska, right? So I'm imagining in spring, you know, they're really happy just to see the blue, and then in summer, the yellow is beating down. Probably in winter, they use a black sign or something. Um, good contrast, good. Um, even the alignment of this, I think, is really nice, too. So yeah, this, there's just something about this design that makes me really happy. This is super simple, and I know that you all could do this because it's a circle, a rectangle, and two fonts, right? It's pretty easy. Okay. So let's talk about some of the creation tools. And these are some of the questions that you guys have been asking over here. Um, what kind of, of, you know, what kind of tools to use to create designs. Remember, you're not alone. There's lots of design tools out there to help you. And here are some of them. So there's the standard Adobe Creative Suite, um, the Photoshop, the Illustrator, the InDesign. To me, this is kind of the high-end design software. It's what the pros use. Um, but it's got a steep learning curve, and it's expensive. Um, so a lot of us don't have the time or the money to deal with Adobe. Um, if you are lucky enough to have a campus license or institutional license on campus, uh, you can probably take advantage of tutorials online, um, the help buttons within those programs, maybe, like I said, YouTube videos, um, somewhere to get you up and running on, on Adobe. To me, um, Adobe's always been just a little bit out of my reach, so there's still Microsoft products for the rest of us. And honestly, this is all you need sometimes. So Word, Publisher, and PowerPoint, they all have similar design features that allow you to insert shapes, help you align the elements, and help you manipulate the images. Um, each one, I think, is better at something than the other. So when I work in Microsoft products, I work cross-platform. So I started Word, and I get my text down. 
and then I'll copy that into Publisher or into, into PowerPoint. So you can copy between all the, the Microsoft products, copy-paste. Um, I use Publisher and PowerPoint for my images and for my elements, um, you know, for colors and that kind of stuff. I just find those better. So I just kind of go back and forth between the programs. So um, another user-friendly popular option that a lot of librarians are taking advantage of these days are the online drag-and-drop graphic tools like Canva, PictoChart, Easily, S'more. There's a whole bunch of them out there these days. Um, and I get why people want to use them. It's because when you go to that site, it gives you, you know, choose these backgrounds, choose these fonts, choose these images. That's cool. It's nice. If you have a lot of information and you want to make a quick design, maybe like an infographic and you don't want to make it all yourself, those are fantastic sites to try out. And most of them, I believe, are free for educational use. So I mentioned Google Slides earlier. There's a lot you can do within Google Docs. Um, this presentation was made with Google Slides, and to me it's very similar to PowerPoint. Um, you you know, can choose your colors, you can make really cute graphics. Um, and what I think is even better about the Google Docs is that it's a collaborative design environment. So I mentioned um, I'm the co-creator of this website. The other co-creator lives in Maryland, and she and I, um, we work all the time together. Yet we're not on the phone, or we're not texting, we're on... Google Chat usually, or we'll say, let's open up a Google, Google Doc and let's play with the colors or something like that. So the Google Docs allow you to do real-time collaboration. I can move something, she can see me move it. So if you're ever working with someone, you know, for a presentation to give it you know, ALA or something, and you guys are in two different sites, I highly recommend Google Slides or even Google Draw to make um, images and stuff. Okay. So at this point, we've talked about all the tools and the principles and the workflow when creating a design. Um, one thing that you need to keep in mind is maintaining a consistent look and feel across your print and your visual media designs so that your community can recognize your library's brand. And this could make it easier for you, right? We talked about institutional standards kind of holding us back at the beginning. You could make your own library standards. Um, you could... Uh, decide that, you know, this is going to be our brand, this color, this font is going to be used on all of these, these PowerPoints and I'm giving all of the handouts that I'm putting out. And that way it kind of, it gives you a, a direction to go. And I'll share, I'll share what I'm working on in just a few minutes with that. But consider the way that your online presence can match up with your print medium. And let me give you an example of that. So this is the Richland Public Library in South Carolina, and I've never been there. Um, just while looking for nice library websites to model my own library website after, I found this one. And it's beautiful, right? It's totally simple. Um, the colors are really calming with the blue. The text is, um, or the fonts are very uh, kind, of, kind of standard, but very clear and readable. Um, the black and white pictures scroll through here, and then the things that are highlighted in color are the book covers there. And so it's just, it's real easy to look at. So they've got a great logo up there. That Richland Library um, looks like an open book, but it could also look like a chat bubble, and I think that's pretty clever. Um, they've obviously got the color scheme, the fonts, and then their slogan, um, Access Freely, is what they've got in there. So that's really nice. It's an excellent example of a brand. Um, do I think that they did this by themselves? I have no idea. They may have had a professional, um, you know, a professional designer come in and do it for them, but really it's, it's fairly simple. Okay, so this is their website. And to show you consistency, this is their Facebook page. Again, you can see the same colors. As much as they can within Facebook, they've tried to personalize their site. So it's their Facebook site. This is their Twitter. Again, you're seeing the black and white and the blue. Luckily, um, you know, Twitter is kind of that blue color already, so they kind of locked out with that. But you can see consistency. I would imagine if I walked inside the Richland Library, I would be hit with this blue color and this whole field throughout their library, or that's what I would hope, at least. Um, and I would imagine if I pick up any of their handouts, they'll be branded just like this as well. Okay, so um, the next slide is not nearly as pretty. This is what I'm working on. So the Richmond Library can seem a little bit intimidating, but a way to begin is to create a library logo. Um, or if you have one already, to use it on every single piece of print and web and visual material you create. So this is a sneak peek 
of my logo that I'm working on here at Sol Ross, and I really just started this summer. Um, the very top one is what I inherited, and I can't stand it. Um, the bar, SR bar, um, that's kind of our, it was our school's old logo, and the Brian Wildenthal Memorial Libraries and Comic Sans and Sol Ross State University, I don't even know what that font is, but it's not pretty. Um, so that's what I inherited, and immediately I felt like, ugh, I've got to, um, I gotta change this. So my second, um, my second thought was to do Sol Ross on one side with our new logo and Brian Wildenthal Memorial Library. Um, but some feedback from my staff said that when they looked at that word library, all they could see was the word Bray for some, like they couldn't read it. Um, and I think it's because it's lowercase. So our um, campus recently. Uh, gave us our brand standards. So they recently told us the fonts that we need to be using and the colors. So I had applied that in that logo, but then I took it a step further and thought, well, if you can't read the lowercase, let's make library uppercase. And the star is really important to sell us. So I'm using that. Okay. So then the fourth one down is my variation on the logo. Um, what makes our campus really unique is that we're located up in the mountains and it's really beautiful out of the library windows. Like you walk in the library and you gasp looking out the windows. So I want to take advantage of those mountains. So while my main logo might be the third one down, the Brian Wildenthal Memorial Library in all caps, I think I'm going to use the bottom two as kind of my accent logos. Um, and in fact, the very bottom one is what I've made a PowerPoint template out of. So um, made a template so that when my um, you know, collection development librarian goes out to talk to faculty at faculty meetings, she can use a PowerPoint that's already been made with a template at the bottom. It certainly meets brand standards, but it's also slightly more creative to give you a little bit of the library in there too. So when thinking about making this logo, again, I thought about what made my library unique, but I also tried to stay within my um, my university's standards. So um, some libraries choose to use standardized fonts on all their publications, and if you're feeling ambitious, um, like I said, you could make a template um, for PowerPoints. So you could make a template for all signage that's going to go up around your library, um, and so then you're beginning to kind of wrangle in this whole uh, look and feel of, of what your library is. Just more than anything, you want to make sure that your users connect with you and recognize your library's efforts to look professional, to be branded, to kind of put forth a cohesive look. Because that's what people expect when they walk into something. Okay, so we are just about done here. Um, but I'm going to take a look at your questions in just a few minutes. But I hope the information I've shared with you today um, can help inspire you to take control of your library's visual communications and to, to use intentional thinking, to use the basic principles we've talked about, the processes, and even the ideas of branding to improve the print and, material, and the web materials that you're creating. So again, I encourage you to visit Library Design Share, um, check it out, submit your designs because you're all working on stuff. Um, remember that you can search by uh, design types or design tools. And one thing that I may not have mentioned is that all of the designs on Library and Design Share, so everything you've seen today and more, are all freely um, available. We have a Google Drive. You click on the link to our Google Drive. You can download them and you can manipulate them for your own use. So if you need something already kind of ready-made, you can probably find it on the site. And all the favorite resources that I've mentioned earlier are on one screen here, um, as well as a few other resources under design. Um, there's a few books there and a website that could help you. Uh, the Non-Designers Design and Type book is very helpful, easy to read, um, gives you some good, clear ideas to go forward. Also, the ACRL Tech Connect um, blog, they had a design 101 feature for a little while that um, I loved reading. I found really helpful. Finally, I'm happy to answer any questions in the next five minutes. I'm going to take a look at our question screen. Um, anything you guys need to know, I'm happy to, to hang around and answer. So let me see. Um, Okay, so the question is, what if your institution look and brand is ugly? Um, with an ugly logo, red and white and blue, and the brand colors. It's a challenge. I totally agree. Yeah, that's pretty bad. 
Um, so you've got those colors. So red, white, and blue to me is almost like a superhero kind of thing, right? Or um, maybe you can minimize one of the colors and capitalize on the red and the white or the blue and the white and then just add the other color as a line. So you can stick within brand stand and or institutional brand standards and kind of manipulate them a bit. And um, from experience, I found that if you can show your university, like if they've got their eye on you and they're, they're watching what you're turning out, if you can show them that you are making good designs and that you're attempting to fall within their alignment, it's usually, um, they're usually pretty impressed and they're usually okay with you. Okay, um, light blue is the third color in the red, white, and blue. <laughs> Um, well, cap again, um, you could, you know, I'm trying to think, think of a, like a landscape maybe, maybe you could try to put blue at the top or something, white at the bottom, a red line separating the two, um, or like begin searching some of those, um, those color sites that I mentioned, and maybe the red, white, and blue will be put together in a certain way that, you know, could inspire you. Of course, blue is never, light blue is never going to be a great text color to use. So you're, of course, going to have to infuse black or gray or something on your slides that way. Let's see. Let's see what else we've got. Guidelines for the amount of text to include. Um, probably depends on the design. Uh, I would not include any more text than I've included on these slides. So um, if you wanted to do a percentage or something, um, if you're making a PowerPoint, maybe no more than... 20% text on a PowerPoint, something like that. Um, I feel like people usually connect with an image, and if you can, if you can find an image that either is cute or funny or speaks to them or can uh, illustrate what you're trying to talk about, that's great. A PowerPoint these days should just kind of um, highlight your talk, not necessarily give the users everything they need for your talk. Um, if you're making a website, of course you're going to have to include a lot of text probably in explanations, but maybe not on the first page of your website. Um, on the first page of your website, it should be friendly and navigatable. Navigatable? Um, easy to find things um, from your website. So, you know, maybe, maybe using big blocks of images to click on for students, for faculty, for parents, or something like that. Um, I would say, yeah, text, people just, people aren't reading, they're not reading our signs full of text either. So keep it short, keep it polite and to the point. Let's see. All right, got another question. Our staff is copying and pasting a lot of very busy digital signs into a brochure. Thoughts? Hmm. So you're copying and pasting signs into a brochure. Um, not quite sure what you mean. I'm thinking, okay, a brochure is obviously going to include quite a bit of text too. I would go with bullet points to get text across, um, or numbered items. Large paragraphs of text um, aren't, aren't easily readable. Um, so bullet points and images, um, maybe, you know, important things in, in, a, in a rectangle of color or something like that. What else? Or you can, she means programming brochure, an events flyer. Um, so you're having, you've got an events flyer that they're copying into a brochure. This is the hard thing about, chat, about chat, it's hard to figure out what everybody's talking about. Um, if they are copyright images or something like that, like, okay, let's say this is a flyer for Pokemon Go, which is what everyone's talking about right now. You want to be careful about using those kind of images. Um, you probably want to instead just kind of make it more friendly. Um, I'm trying to read our chat thing too. We create JPEG signs for TV monitor postings. Uh, we do that too here. So if you've got a TV monitor that uh, can scroll a PowerPoint maybe, um, or scroll pictures, you can actually create signage that way. Again, I would not put a whole lot of text on something that's scrolling in people's face. Um, and I would not put a lot of like long websites either. Maybe see a librarian for more information. And I know that we only have just a minute or two, Jessica. Let's see. And somebody else had asked about the font that you're using in the presentation. Okay. So this font, 
I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. Um, it's definitely a sans serif. I feel like it might be century gothic in this. I can figure that out. I can let you guys know. Um, it's definitely a, a font that I downloaded and um, was, no, it's not actually. It's a font that Google Slides has. So just like Microsoft Word, Google Slides has a list of fonts that you can choose from. And I feel like this is a century gothic kind of font. Maybe a new -y gothic, something like that. Cool. Well, thank you, April. We just recently uh, went through the rebranding process as well, but we're still finalizing colors. So once we get our colors, I'm going to have a lot of fun playing around with some of these things. Are you able to choose your colors, or is your institution choosing? We have a couple of options on the table right now, and I had very strong feelings about which one I like, and so far uh, the board likes a different version, so we'll see uh -huh. what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to work with someone else's limitations on you, but um, I know the person earlier asked about like red, white, and blue. If you look at this slide, it's not that different than red, white, and blue. You could probably do the same thing, and it wouldn't look that crazy. Right, and we're currently maroon, which is very hard to match, and so anything will be better than what we're working with now, so I'll be happy either way. <laughs> Yeah, traditional school colors are hard to work with. They are, yeah. My fit. Make a line across the bottom of maroon or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much, and I want to thank everyone else for joining us. And I'll be sending out a recording of this presentation. It will probably be in about a week or so. And Great. I'd like to also invite you all to a webinar that we're having on August 25th, and that will be on Tor and SciHub and the Dark Web. So please join us. Thank you all for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to talk more offline. All right. Thank you so Thanks. much, Jessica. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone.